fellow Falcoholics, what is up? Welcome to episode 206 of the Falcoholic Live. I am your host, Kevin Knight at Falcoholic Kevin, joined by a special guest this evening. He is Aaron Freeman at Falc Fans. Aaron, how are we doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm ready to fight about Marcus Mariota versus Desmond Ritter. And I actually said the name correctly, which I refuse to do on Locked on Falcon. So <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Yep, it's a well. I know for a fact we have like several Hawaiian listeners that like tweet at me every time uh, that Adnan says it wrong. So you know, if you say, it, <laughs> I'm gonna get twice as many tweets. But you know, Adnan, Adnan's shaping up. He's, he's, I think he's saying it correctly like seventy percent of the time. It, it, I it's, think, because one, it's because one of those tweets came to me directly. This yes, past yes. Week, and mm-hmm. Like, all right. It, yeah. Now, now I have to. But yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's challenging. But you know, I go with the Marcus Mariota. You know, that that's how I remembered it. So I'm sure eventually everyone will get it. But yeah, uh, if Kevin's suffering the consequences of my actions, <laughs> I'm okay with that. But you know, as soon as it's me, then it's like, all right, let me let me shape up. Yeah, exactly. Adon's fine as long as it's just punishing me. But you know, if it's if it's gonna hurt his numbers, then that that's something else entirely. But yes, as you guys can see, we're also joined by my co-host Adon Ikich tonight. He is at Say Which Way on the Twitter's Adon. How are we doing aside from the tweets about Marcus Mario? Uh, I'm doing well. Yeah, uh, Aaron had no idea that we were just gonna invite him on and talk about how great Marcus Mariota was for the next couple hours. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. there. was there even another quarterback in that game? I just only remember the Marcus Mariota drive. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's going to be tough talking about, you know, the last three and a half quarters of that game where absolutely nothing happened. In that game. <laughs> yeah. I just turned it off after Mariota's uh, touchdown, you know, I, that was all I needed to see the whole night. So, <laughs> no, it's yeah, no. Desmond Ritter also had a good game, you know, for the record, folks. Uh, a, a very impressive, exciting game. Uh, also had probably should have thrown a couple picks, but hey, he's a rookie in his first NFL game. What, what do you want? Uh, that was it was about honestly what I was expecting for him. Better than expected, obviously, with the, the late game heroics that we'll definitely get to here early in the show, guys. We're gonna break down that game. Uh, I know Aaron has had a chance to to. Uh, get into to depth about the guys that he thinks you know help themselves and hurt themselves i know because i listen to the podcast while i'm working on my uh mass effect costume armor which takes you know many many hours so uh, i definitely get get those locked on falcons pods in so you know shout out to locked on falcons every day but uh yeah we're gonna break that stuff down guys we're also gonna get to some jets falcons versus jets takes uh aka the yearly offensive line crucifixion uh that seems to happen when we play the jets so we'll see uh if that happens this year or not so far the offensive line has done decently well uh no sacks allowed so that that's something um so yeah guys we will get to that great stuff we'll also of course take any questions that you have uh throughout uh like and subscribe all that good stuff now for the takes um yeah where to start we'll start with the quarterbacks because that's what that's what the most contentious part of the game right somehow both falcons quarterbacks being good is contentious but uh with the starters Mariota came in uh executed a touchdown drive two only through two passes both were complete one was a great pass to uh drake london maybe the the throw of the night i mean i think you in terms of like wow factor the uh obviously the final play from desmond Ritter. you know you can't really beat that situation but in terms of the accuracy and everything the drake london throw i think was certainly up there in terms of degree of difficulty but um didn't see a ton of passing attempts from mariota what we did see was a lot of willingness to use his legs maybe even too much for a preseason game uh but it was interesting to see that sort of part of the offense actually be unlocked and we haven't really seen that since like the days of mike vick here so Aaron, as the guest, I'll let you get in your takes on on Marcus Mariota's uh, performance, you know, and then we'll get to the the copious amounts of Ritter praise after that. Yeah, contrary to popular opinion, I do think Marcus Mariota played well uh, on that opening <laughs> drive. Uh, made some plays, as you say, Kevin, with his legs. Made an, a couple of nice throws, big third down uh, conversion to Kadero Hodge, and, and that big play uh, Drake London, and sort of used his legs to keep the offense on schedule. Um, in addition to the, you know, official run game, uh, the sort of the unofficial run game with his sort of uh, scrambling ability. And that's going to be an asset for this team uh, moving forward where, you know, they may not necessarily have the most efficient passing game. You know, Mario is not necessarily known for being a highly efficient 
uh, quarterback and passer and processor and a guy that's going to win with the quick game um, and all those things that we have grown accustomed to with Matt Ryan over the last decade and a half. Uh, so that mobility is going to be an asset for him and this offense to sort of compensate for whatever drop off we get uh, from him in that sort of straight drop back passing game. Uh, so, you know, I think he did a good enough job uh, to sort of, you know, give us some optimism for the upcoming season. And that's, you know, that's all I can say positive about Marcus Mario. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I know, like, it, it's, it's, there's a lot to get to with that. I mean, I think I'm excited because I think it means the team will be more fun to watch this year. But I, I you know, it's, it's been a weird, you know, feeling for me because I was like king of Ritter Hive like all off season. And then now I'm out here, like, you know, somehow become the face of Marcus Mariota town, uh, Mariota town. Uh Oh, gotta be careful. Um, <laughs> they will come for you. They will. Yes, they will. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to see that dichotomy, but, uh, Adnan, I'll get your, your take as well. I know you were calling the game with me. What did you think about Mariota's first performance, uh, for the Falcons? Uh, I thought it looked fantastic. Um, I can't really recall, uh, or say that there was a single play where it was negative for him. Um, the only criticism I will say is he he does need to slide down a little bit on some of those runs, um, and I'm pretty sure that the coaching staff worked with him about that because in practice, uh, during the next practice, apparently he was uh, he, he was doing a better job of, of quickly sliding down. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, he had three runs, uh, total 23 yards, um, all very positive runs. What I like about those runs is that it, it, they weren't panic runs where he just um, it, he just dropped his head and was like, all right, let me just go get the yardage right now. It was after he progressed through his reads, saw that there was nothing, he he got some yardage out of it. Um, went two for two. One was that amazing pass, that wonderful pass to Drake London where he, he hit him right where it was supposed to be, where Drake London could uh, – could go in stride on first and 20 and that got in the media first down. Um, uh, London apparently is okay. Thankfully mm -hmm. after that injury, the other one was the pass to uh, Kaderil Hodge where Hodge uh, slid down and caught a nice 12 yard catch. And that, that touchdown run, that six yard touchdown run was really nice where he, he just dived for the pylon, um, got, got to the edge faster than the Detroit Lions linebacker. I forgot who it was just scored the touchdown up yeah. overall. Um, I think PFF also graded him as the top graded quarterback in the, uh, in the league for that preseason game. I'll take that with a grain of salt. I don't really trust PFF grades with, with quarterbacks, especially. Um, but he, he looked really good. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't have been happier with his drive and that drive that he led was, it was 12 plays, 82 yards, and it took nine and a half minutes off the clock. And it was in response to Detroit just going just going right downfield and scoring their own touchdown. So, I mean, I really I really can't say anything bad about Mariota's performance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was good. It was only one series, so we got a much, like, deeper look at Ritter. Um, and it should be, you know, Ritter played against backups, but he also had to play with backups you know the the receiving talent the quality wasn't quite on par uh for what Mariota had to work with so you know it it's it, you take it with what it is but I think it was nice to see Mariota have a very good start you know and you never know like obviously he has experience in the offense from his time with Arthur Smith in Tennessee but it's still a new quarterback coming into a new team with new weapons, new everything around him. Um, so that's to see it executed well to start off the preseason when we haven't always seen that happen here in Atlanta, certainly. It's nice. It's nice. Um, but now we'll get to the man of the night, Desmond Ritter, who I think had a, a good game. Um, obviously, the late game heroics make it very exciting. Uh, you love that he took that sort of shot. You know, you, you love that the play was complete. You love that Jaron Bernhardt was involved, and we'll talk about him later too. Um, but I would say that Ritter's accuracy was sort of hit or miss. Uh, I know that's like contentious for people for some reason, but... Um, or on Twitter. I know. Like, it, like some of the passes that were caught were not easy catches. Some of the passes that were dropped were not easy catches. Um, 
and some of the passes that were dropped were just dropped. Like, I mean, that's fair. But Ritter probably should have thrown two picks. One was wiped out by a very, very weak, um, very, Rough. very weak, you know, roughing the passer penalty. So it is what it is. The other one was just straight up dropped by the defender. So that, that you know, that is what it is. That's going to happen sometimes. But, you know, I, I think I rated it, you know, what I don't know what they call the stat, like turnover-worthy throws. Like, I think he had three throws that could have been picked off. He threw one into triple coverage that... Uh, was pretty dangerous. Luckily, it was on target, uh, you know, so it wasn't... If it had been bobbled or anything like that, though, that, that would have been very dangerous. But again, other than that, you know, in a couple of passes that weren't exactly on the mark, I think that Ritter actually had pretty good accuracy on some. I know that Parker Hesse touchdown uh, was a good one. Then the other, you know, should have been touchdown, I guess, to Parker Hesse. That was a little overthrown. It was a really tough catch, um, but, you know, it was close. And then the Felipe Franks one, Franks did have to, like, slow down and come back to it a little bit. But again, like, you know, high degree of difficulty play. Franks almost came up with a circus catch. Um, you know, whatever. I, I think it was it was a good performance, though. And we also saw him run, which we haven't really seen him do a lot at practice. Uh, but clearly he was able to do that. So that's always nice to see. Uh, but uh, I'll let you get the first crack here on uh, Desmond Ritter's performance and your, your opinion on it. I mean, yeah, Desmond Ritter in his first ever NFL game, his first preseason game, looked solid. Like he he had he had some really nice plays. He had a couple of really nice runs. Uh, that highlight reel, uh, late touchdown, which you know, which made us all feel good. Uh, I couldn't stop raving about that touchdown after it happened, just because of the scenario. Um, and I was getting some pushback. Uh, on Twitter for being so positive about it uh, where people are like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, that's, that's picked like uh, in, in a regular game, but it's like, all right, it's fourth and nine. All you can ask of him on that touchdown is to give his wide receiver a chance. And Bernhard Bernhard may have even made a better play than Ritter on that one because he, he got in front of the defender, boxed him out and just came away with that touchdown catch. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about him a little later as well on some of those, um, some of those unsung heroes, uh, so to speak, that became heroes in this game, which I can't wait to talk about. Um, but yeah, Ritter, it wasn't all amazing. However, um, you know, as 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 difficult as it is to accept uh, for some people, Desmond Ritter wasn't you know perfect out there. Um, sure, there there were some drops which were which were unfortunate. Um, the Geronimo Allison drop should that should have been caught straight up. Uh, I don't, I don't blame Felipe Franks for his drop because, like you said, Kevin, that would have been a circus catch. The Parker Hesse would be touchdown drop. I'm not expecting Parker Hesse to make that catch. Uh, I think Parker Hesse comes away, comes down with that with both feet and bounds like two times out of ten. Uh, in all honesty, yeah. because that ball there wasn't very much room. Uh, to come down with and to get both feet down, even if he would have made that catch. Um, there, w- there were two, at least two should be turnovers. Uh, the first one was the interception, which was wiped out by that roughing the passer penalty. And that roughing the passer had no bearing on the play. Like it happened after the throw was already made. And on that final drive before the touchdown pass was made, that was just a straight drop by the Detroit Lions, the defender. It was, it was not a great pass. It it came closer to the defender than to the wide receiver, and it should have been intercepted. But overall, you know, for his first ever game, uh, the coaching staff was pleased. I I was happy with it. Uh, you're you're happy with what you saw. Uh, he had over 150 total yards. Came away with that feel good touchdown and. One of the most impressive throws of the night was his first touchdown pass. It was only a one-yard pass, but just the touch that he made to get it up to Parker Hesse to to loop it over the defensive line and to perfectly get it into Hesse's hands that was, you know, that was very impressive. And yeah. it's really nice to see that Ritter has that because some people criticized his touch in college that you know he he doesn't really have that instinctive light touch sometimes so to see him make that play was was wonderful you know overall very solid performance and you know Desmond Ritter can can be proud of it and the coaching staff can be proud of it but 
Marcus Mariota was better overall. I, I don't think that that's a hot take. I think that's that's an objective statement that Mariota what was the better quarterback in his one series versus what we saw from Ritter the rest of the night. Um, and this isn't a quarterback competition at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's also like, it's not a one-to-one thing either. And like, it's hard to communicate this sort of stuff over Twitter, you know, despite Aaron and I like pretending to have beef about this, you know, we don't really have serious beef. It's more, it's more just a show for you guys. Cause it's funny. Um, but you know, it, Mariota had one drive where he basically did everything right for the most part. And then Ritter had like six drives where it was up and down. But like if, if Mariota had had more drives, probably would have had some up and downs too. So it, it, so when I say like, oh, well, Mariota was better, he did have just one drive. So it's like he was great yeah. on the one drive. So it's like, of course he was better. But all, yeah, it's, all yeah. we can judge is what we saw from them. But at the same time, if Mariota goes out there and, you know, the team punts it away, then he's getting criticized for that lack of sample size. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'll open the floor to you, Aaron, now, you know, talking about our imagined beef on Twitter. But uh, I know you were really enthused by Ritter's performance, as was I. But, uh, you know, since you had to qualify that, of course, you were also impressed with Mariota. But uh, give me give me your thoughts on the future, you know, uh, at, at quarterback potentially for the Falcons. Yeah, I think Ritter's performance was incredible relative to the fact that it was his first game. He's a rookie. You know, it's been a long time in Atlanta since we've had a rookie quarterback with any expectations come here. Uh, it's basically 14 years. And hey, so Dante Davis was here. A I will not take Dominic <laughs> Davis. Okay. No slander. Yeah. All right. All right. You know, I, I, I didn't know if you were going to push back on Sean Rimfrey or, or something oh, like man. that. But, uh... Kurt Bankert, excuse me. <laughs> that, that was long name for uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Continue. But yeah, you know, I think so. Like, I, I feel like, yeah, I think Adnan pointed out we can sit here and, and pick nitpick and, and point out flaws in Desmond Ritter's game. But truth be told, like, if you watch other teams in the preseason, again, like, this doesn't necessarily apply to the Falcons because it's just been so long since we've had to worry about this. But if you are literally any of the other 31 teams in the league and you're constantly having quarterbacks come in and you watch their first preseason game, a lot of them are very bad in their first preseason games. And Desmond Ritter, while not perfect, I think was very good. It was very clear given that he was playing with mostly third stringers um, and, and some second stringers and, I think some people, myself being one of those people, would argue that a lot of players that are second stringers on the Falcons would probably be third stringers <laughs> on a lot of other teams. Um, and it was very clear to me that he was the best player on the field. Like, and he was making those guys look like they were competent, you know, NFL players by putting together a couple of a solid drives, a couple of solid throws. As Adnan says, like there were some, there were some drops, there were some missed throws, you know, the, both of those. Uh, you know, would be interceptions were plays where he faced a lot of pressure. It shouldn't be a shock. I don't think to anybody that quarterbacks, particularly young quarterbacks, uh, struggle with pressure. That's one of the things why, like, when you look at the history of the league and you see the successful rookie quarterbacks, almost all of them play behind good offensive lines because it's just a, the NFL is just a different beast. The speed of the game is is different and the windows close faster in the NFL. And I think despite all of that, I think Ritter played really, really well. Um, I know the interception that got called back, you know, he said in a post-game interview that it was a miscommunication. It, you know, it, it, you could, again, we don't necessarily know, but it looked like he threw a curl while the wide receiver ran an out, and that led to the ball being behind the receiver, and, and that allowed the defender to sort of pick it off. Um, so, you know, we don't necessarily know that, but, you know, I'll trust Desmond Ritter at his word uh, in that regard. And then the other thing that I was really impressed with was his ability to make off structure plays um, and off structure, meaning like, you know, outside of the design of the play and using his legs to extend plays. We saw that on that big play to Geronimo Allison that set up the touchdown. We saw that on, on the final throw that he made to Jared Bernhardt. And that was something that Ritter was not very good at at Cincinnati, you know, living outside of structure, despite his athleticism and the speed and all these various things. Like when he had to extend plays outside the pocket, 
he wasn't that good at that. You know, he, he made some plays by that, but like he wasn't going to be this guy that was going to, you know, thrive in, in a chaotic environment in the ways that someone like a Marcus Mariota, who's that's kind of what he's the best at. It's it's sort of the out of structure stuff that Mariota kind of excels in rather than the sort of within structure stuff that we know Matt Ryan was especially good at. Um, and so I think that's a positive sign because at some point when Desmond Ritter is playing games for the Falcons, particularly if it's this season, I don't think he's going to have the world's greatest protection. Uh, and that's going to kind of require him to have to, you know, make some of these all structure plays. And the fact that he could do that uh, in his first action gives me hope that at least he'll have, you know, a fighter's chance in those situations. So while we can sit here and nitpick and say, you know, um, and, and not as right, right. Like, you know, if you just want to sort of, compare you know apples to apples like yeah Mariota was better but given that Ritter is young and you know like seven years less of experience that Mario had as um you know it's not really a fair comparison um in that regard and and I like I know I not understands that but it's just one of those things where like I think you know you kind of have to grade these guys on a curve at least the, right. the young mm -hmm. players and I think you know Ritter passed that grade this test with flying colors yeah yeah I, I agree and like the the law, and I, I know you've mentioned it a lot, is that you're you're already sort of over this season. I think like you're like not that you're like not interested in watching it at all, but I think you're sort of already in terms of your. No, I, I am not interested in watching this. The only reason I'm watching it is because I get paid to watch it. That's the only reason. But, but Aaron, I thought we were going to win twelve games. <laughs> no, we're going to win seventeen games, are not. Yes, come on, get it together. Get get your predictions in order. But yeah, I mean, so you're 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 taking a much longer term look at this team basically chalking up this season as you know i think someone referred to it as like a red shirt season so it's, you know it is sort of what it is um but so in that case like ritter is gonna be a more interesting player right someone more interesting to talk about long term um so yeah i mean i, I get that i get that angle of it like that that you would want to focus on his quality performance as opposed to the performance of Mariota, who, like you said, like, I believe you called him a sacrificial lamb or whatever, <laughs> you know, you know, says, you know, hopefully the offensive line keeps him from, from being sacrificed, but uh, someone that's, that's a stopgap starter and look in, in a perfect world, Mariota has a great season. Ritter's able to come in for a few games. The Falcons, you know, maybe can then trade Mariota. You have a situation where you've got two good quarterbacks. Maybe the Falcons can flip, Mariota to a team that will actually want to make him a starter. Uh, whereas, you know, the Falcons, if, if Ritter is impressive enough, will probably just move on to, to Ritter. But by the end of this year, we're going to know one way or another, right? If, if it's going to be Ritter or if they're going to need to go after another quarterback, because if they're as bad as some fear, it's like, okay, well now you're in position to be drafting, a top quarterback. So is Ritter good enough to keep you from doing that? So if he is, that's awesome. Then you can get a Will Anderson or a Jalen Carter, or you could trade back for a bunch of resources. If he's not, then maybe they do take a guy or maybe, you know, Mar in some crazy world, Mariota like has a career renaissance. It is like a top 10 quarterback. And then, then we're all confused and we don't know what the hell's going on. And it's just, you know, weird. And this team is probably actually like somewhat good this year out of nowhere. So it, it, it these are all things that are on the spectrum of possibility, but I think the most likely scenario is that the Falcons win like four to seven games. Again, you know, we have some, some flashes on both sides of the ball that are encouraging, but again, like the talent level overall is going to keep this team probably from competing along with the schedule. Like they have a brutal schedule this year. It, it is sort of what it is. Um, but Ritter is, I think the future or at least you hope that he's the future. Um, and it's like weird for me, like that, that this whole thing came about where I'm like talking about Mariota having a good game. Everyone thinks that I'm like a Ritter hater. And it's like, do you, did you guys like follow me yesterday? Like I was the guy out here you were yelling at when I was like, Oh, the Falcons really like Ritter. They might have to take him in the first round. And you guys were like, Oh, you're stupid, Kevin. Like Ritter ain't worth that pick. You know, what are you talking about? You're crazy. You're just like a Ritter, you know, fanatic or whatever. And now I'm out here trying to calm everyone down about Ritter. It's because I'm, you know, intellectually honest, I guess, you know, I just, you know, I don't just stand mindlessly unless you're Austin Trammell, which, then, then I stand forever. But you know, shout out to Austin Trammell, by the way, getting a shot with the Rams. But uh, it's been, an, it'll be interesting to monitor this this quarterback situation. But I agree. Like, if you were looking to see 
regardless of which quarterback you like, you have to be happy with what you saw. Like if you're big all in on, on Mariota, and I know we have a lot of Hawaiian like viewers that are big Mariota fans, like the best thing Mariota can do is go out there and play great this year. Uh, and then whether it's with the Falcons or another team, like if he plays great, he'll have a chance to start either in Atlanta going forward or for another team. So like none of us are arguing against Mariota playing well, certainly like that would be great to see or whatever. I, I know Aaron's point is more that the Falcons invested a, a pick in Ritter and they're probably hoping to see Ritter take the reins sooner rather than later. So Mariota may not be in this team's long-term plans, but um, it just sort of is what and, it is, and, right? And yeah. if I can just say one more thing about uh, Ritter, especially for this being his first game, I think maybe the most impressive thing I saw from him is just his response to uh, the disaster, so to speak. So, you know, he throws out interception, uh, gets a mulligan for it on uh, on the rocking the passer penalty. And then he came right back and he wasn't flustered. He wasn't panicked. You know, he wasn't, uh, you know, gun shy at all. Uh, he, he, I think, I don't know if that's the, yeah, that's, that's the, um, the drive where he threw the pass to Parker Hesse. So, even after he got that mulligan, even after he threw that interception, five plays later, he leads the team to the end zone. On that final drive where he should have thrown that interception, whereas, you know, some young quarterbacks would, like I said, get a little bit gun shy there, uh, that drive ends in that uh, game winning touchdown. So, you know, from a maturity aspect for this being his first game, uh, I think you're thrilled uh, just from the mental aspect. And, this is something that Arthur Smith talked about in training camp, but that's the biggest thing he's looking for. Um, just how you respond to those mistakes, how you respond to those times of adversity, because those times are going to come for all of us. They're going to come for every player. Not, not every play is going to be perfect, but you know, how, how do you pick yourself back up after you're on the ground is, is what matters. And I think, I think Desmond Ritter did a fantastic job of that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I certainly like the performance from Ritter. I am a huge Ritter fan, to make it clear to everyone that maybe isn't clear on that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, we'll, we'll see how he does this week and, and going forward. Uh, but I'm excited. Uh, and it was basically, if you were looking for a positive sign to be excited about Desmond Ritter, that was about as clear a sign as you could get. Because uh, we, like, like Aaron mentioned, like, we're so used to bad quarterback play in the preseason in Atlanta. Like, after Matt Ryan left the game, it was just like a disaster. Like, even Matt Schaub, who came in and played very well in the regular season a lot, he was not a good preseason quarterback. I feel like he always looked awful in the preseason. Um, but, you know, uh, Sean Renfrey, you know, Ben Curt. Ben Curt actually showed some flashes, but the poor guy just kept getting hurt here. Um, but, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm excited going forward, certainly. But let's move on to the, the next biggest topic, which is the offensive line. Didn't surrender a sack. They certainly surrendered some pressure. Uh, but again, the mobile quarterbacks, you know, they were able to avoid it. They were able to, to not actually get sacked. So, uh, And the run game was was humming. You know, I think the blocking was pretty good overall. Uh, I think they, they got a lot of yardage there. Uh, a lot of the running backs had good games, including Algier and, and Olison. I think were the two guys that had the best nights. Uh, but yeah, Aaron, I'll, I'll let you get the first crack at that. What were your thoughts on the first look at the offensive line? Yeah, I'm I'm so used to the Falcons' offensive line looking terrible in preseasons that they came away impressing me. Uh, they, they didn't have, like it wasn't the uh, the the most amazing performance, but as you said, I think they were able to be an effective run blocking team. Uh, we know the Lions weren't exactly the greatest. Um, oh. <laughs> I just distracted you, sorry. <laughs> uh, it, 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 I, it, it just, it sounds different. Me? Yeah, it's like I can tell yeah. you're not using your fancy microphone now. But. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't, I don't know what happened. I tried to yeah. switch yeah. my yeah. headphone. Because okay. that happens to me too. When I, when I turn my Bluetooth on, it like switches my microphone over too, even when I don't want it to. So it's, you know, it's just okay. one of those things. Sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt your flow. I was, I was hoping that it wouldn't, but All right. you know. I'll, I'll, uh, uh, yeah, you can finish the thought. It's not that bad yeah. or anything. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll fix it after I'm done talking. Um, I'll keep it quick, but yeah, I think the run game worked. The Lions offensive line, the defense isn't the, the greatest run defense, but you, you know, 
if you're facing what I think was like the 31st uh, run defense in the league, uh, you want to see this Falcons offensive line being able to control the line of scrimmage. So that's a positive sign. Um, and the fact that, you know, they did give up some pressure, but they did not give up a sack, I think is a, is a positive sign for the offensive line. I'm a little worried about this offensive line going into this Jets game because it's just a history of whenever we face an AFC East team, they kind of expose our offensive line and we have to, to change starters the week after that. But uh, we'll just sort of see if, if they can break that trend against the Jets on Monday night. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm certainly hoping for that uh, as well. But Adnan, I wanted to get your take as well. What, what were your thoughts on the offensive line's first performance? No, uh, it was it was good overall. Like, um, they didn't give up a, a sack, which was really good to see. I think overall there was only one sack in the game the entire night. It should have been two, but Abby Katie was uh, held and he got a holding penalty instead. Um, sure, we remember that Jake Matthews play where Aiden had <laughs> He got Olaid, yeah, on the first yeah. one. Yeah, a little, a little bit of Matador defense uh, on that <laughs> one. But, you, you know, he bounced back and the Falcons offensive line bounced back. Uh, how many times, Kevin, did we talk about the Falcons on first down getting a five-yard run this past game? Yeah, it was uh, it was all the time. I mean, they rushed for almost 170 yards, I think. So Yeah, uh, remember what, what we got, uh, the comment. Uh, America was built on five-yard runs. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to keep saying that. Yeah, for, it's a bit now. I like it. It's, yeah, good. it's now a bit. But overall, the Falcons rushed for 168 yards on 29 carries. That's 5.8 yards a carry. Like, you'll take that every single day of the week. Every single game, I will sign up to to get six yards a carry on the run game, especially on that much volume. Um, the, the offensive line overall just – you know, very high marks. Like, sure, there were some plays where, you know, Mariota and Ritter were pressured, but it wasn't anything, anything so disastrous to where it was really, you know, affecting their play and to where they were really getting hit over and over again. Um, sure, it was the Detroit Lions. That they're not a team known for having the most scout pass rush in the NFL, even though they did take Hutchinson with the number two overall pick, but. You know, at this point, you'll I'll take whatever I can get with this offensive line, given given where we've been with them over the past few years. Um, I, I'll stick any feather in my cap with them, and uh, you know they they looked really good. And you'll you'll take this performance if it transitions into the regular season any that any day of the week. Like I I mean I I think they're run blocking overall. If I had to grade it, I I, w- I would give it a, give them an A for it. Um, but yeah, it was it, it it was really good. Uh, I hope I hope that we see continued improvement and you know an extension of what we saw this past week on Monday against the Jets. That that'll make me that'll make me even more confident in them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um... Yeah, I mean, that was the the biggest things. Obviously, we saw Drake London make one spectacular catch and go out. Uh, it does sound like the injury is minor. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if we don't see him again in the preseason just because it's not really worth getting, like, being like, okay, get back out there, London. We need you to get some, you know, impress the fans in the preseason. Um, but, Aaron, I was going to ask if there was anyone else on the offensive side, you know, running backs, receivers, tight ends, whatever, that you wanted to to shout out before we moved on to the defense. I thought all the running backs looked pretty good, um, and especially in pass protection. Uh, Tyler Azier had the big uh, blitz pickup on that final play on the Jared Bernhardt touchdown. There was a couple of nice blitz pickups from Quadri Olison and, and Caleb Huntley throughout the game. And, you know, that's kind of the key for a lot of these guys because, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to get on the field as a running back if you can't, you know, protect – the big investment at the quarterback position that the team has. And right now Patterson and, and Damian Williams are the only two proven guys. And that's been a big reason why Quadri Olson hasn't got really much playing time over the years is because he just hasn't been trustworthy in that. So it's good to see that for him. It's same thing with Tyler Algier. That was going to be to me, the biggest stumbling block for him getting significant playing time this, as a rookie, if he wasn't going to give this team any major value on third downs, uh, as a pass protector. So I think that to me kind of was the thing that stood out the most for me offensively. Um, you know, beyond that, I'm trying to think of did any of the receivers or anything stand out? Mm, 
I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. So, yeah, it, it was mo- mostly the running backs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I certainly liked Jared Bernhardt's catch. You know, shout out to Bernhardt. I think he's he's certainly making a compelling case for the practice squad. We know that the coaching staff really loves him, um, so that's gonna gonna help him out. You know, we we mentioned it before the show, but Kadero Hodge got a lot of work with the starters once uh, London left the game. So it certainly seems to be hinting that Hodge is much to my you know roster project projection sh- uh, chagrin there that uh, Hodge Hodge Hive might be taking over here. Um, but, uh, you know, and Felipe Franks almost had that circus catch downfield, too. That would have been really awesome. Um, and we also saw Parker Hesse working a lot with the first team. Um, so those are the guys that, that I noticed. But uh, Adnan, anyone else you want to shout out as well? Uh, I real I do want to really give a shout out to Quadra Allison uh, for that game. He had, like, he carried the ball five times. And he looked, he looked really explosive on each of those runs. Uh, Algier also had that big 15-yard run where he just exploded through the hole uh, on the right side. It, uh, again, going back to the offensive line, that was, I think, an amazing, uh, an amazing combination by the right side of the offensive line to just make make a hole that uh, I mentioned on mentioned it on the broadcast, Kevin. You you and I could have gotten a few yards on that run. We wouldn't have been as explosive. We wouldn't have gotten 15, but you know it. it could have definitely been positive yardage given how big that hole was. Um, but uh, yeah, overall the wide receivers, Jared Bernhardt, I'm, I'm really happy for. He only had that one catch, but you know, that that's the kind of play that gets you on, on the, on another team's radar for at least a practice squad spot, if not Atlanta's practice squad spot, because I don't think he'll make the team as a final wide receiver, but you know, that that's the kind of, that's kind of a game-changing play uh, for a fringe roster guy. Um, but, yeah, overall, uh, Aaron was mentioning it, the running backs. I'm really happy for Quadri Ellison. This is a guy who's, you know, really fighting for his own roster spot and maybe for a roster spot on another team, maybe a practice squad spot. Uh, he looked he looked really good, um, and Al- Algier did as well. Uh, Caleb Huntley didn't really have the best game. So uh, I I would say that he he kind of didn't do himself uh, many favors when it comes to that running back competition. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, okay, we have a we have a a tip here to troll Aaron uh, from Jason Gaines. So he uh, he says, Aaron, I do have to to troll your ad reads with the two dollars. So thank you, Jason, for for that contribution. He says. Uh, Aaron's appearance tonight is brought to you by the Protein Bars. Whether it's the double-stuffed Anthony Rush Bar, the McGarry Island Coconut Bar, the Pitts Unicorn Bar, or the Pitts Unicorn Bar, be sure to use promo code Fetty Island is better for 20% off. So, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know I like if any that. of those codes work, but, yeah, you guys. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Thank, thank you for that, Jason. That's a funny one. Um, you know, Bill Bars are legitimately good. I, I have had them from time to time. and They're, they're actually a, a good bar. It's not just for the ad read, but, uh, you know. Well, Aaron, do you get like a bunch of those for free at the very least? They they do send a couple of free samples when they when they come out with a new flavor. But Just okay. a couple though. Yeah, it's it, it's enough for you to sample basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, Adnan got like a lifetime supply of Twizzlers because we mentioned Twizzlers a few times on here. Uh, 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 in, in fairness, Evan Evan went up. Evan him. did use his PR <laughs> skills to make that happen, but yeah. <laughs> <I'll>, <laughs> yeah. Also, well, full I, I guess I got to hire Evan then. Yeah, exactly. Evan's really, really crushing it out here. For well, that full point. discretion, I gave all of those Twizzlers away. I, I... <laughs> he could, you couldn't eat them all. There was too many. There's too I'm wearing many the shirt right now. Actually. Yeah, you got it. He's got the sh- Twizzler shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like, mean, it was like so many Twizzlers. Like I would be afraid they would. I mean, I don't know if Twizzlers actually go bad. I feel like they're they're one no, of those they foods don't. you could eat in a nuclear. Yeah, apocalypse. They, they don't. Twizzlers yeah. is one of those foods where, like, if you had it during a zombie apocalypse, yeah, exactly. It would just be it would just be good. Have a box of it. Yeah. Yeah. But that was also a bit that Evan, you know, helped to make reality. So, you know, props to Evan. Yeah, I remember one day it was just three huge boxes showed up in front of my garage. <laughs> yep. Just, yeah, oh, Evan's at, Evan's at it again. So, uh, all right, guys. Well, we are going to actually talk about the defense. And, you know, this is a football show. So we'll, we'll get back to some football topics here. But um, on defense, to me, the big standout was uh, D. Alford. Uh, another one of my, you know, hive guys. I know, I know Aaron's also on the D Alford hive. I think on, oh, no, you're also on the D Alford hive. So this is like a very pro D Alford show, I believe. Um, but yeah, uh, Alford had the interception. 
Uh, that's obviously terrific. The rest of the secondary, honestly, the, the, the starting secondary, the starting defense was a little bit concerning, but it was one series in the first game that they played all season. You know, I think it's not really, uh, not really much to judge there. So, you know, we'll, uh, we'll just sort of gloss over that, but, um, I know we got to see, uh, some good play from the reserve linebackers. Rayshon Evans, in terms of the starters, was maybe the guy who flashed the most on defense. But uh, Adnan, I'll let you go first. Uh, talk about your thoughts on D. Alford or anyone else that uh, caught your attention. Uh, yeah, D. Alford, he played really, really well. Uh, I mean, to the point where we were mentioning it, he should uh, he should get bumped up on that depth chart, and he should get more snaps earlier in the game as, as early as Monday. Um, he had that huge interception. Uh, Arnold Abicady was the player of the game on defense. And, you know, maybe even I, – I, I'd actually say the player of the game overall in this game, uh, as, good as, as good as the quarterbacks were. Abicady just looked so much better than everyone else on the field whenever he was out there. He was always – he was always making some sort of a big impact. He had that big, uh, you know, holding penalty uh, on the Detroit Lions, which which resulted in like a third and 18, which the Falcons, you know, messed up on where, you know, as as much as things change, uh, they stay the same as well from from the past decade. The Falcons are still giving up third and and a mile conversions out here. But, you know, it's not Katie's fault. Um, D'Angelo Malone ha- had some nice pressures. He had, I think he had a really good tackle for a loss on, on, on I, I think it was a screen pass, if, if I remember it correctly. But uh, Abby Katie was wonderful. D. Alford was wonderful. Uh, you like what you saw from Malone. These these rookies are making making an impact. These guys that you selected, talking about Abby Katie and Malone, you want to see them stand out uh you want to mention their names in a positive light uh and you know hopefully we'll see troy anderson in the next game he he yeah. was injured he didn't play in this game um but yeah on defense those guys those guys did a hell of a job and i'd be remiss if i didn't mention um who was it timmy horn who, yeah. who had that huge fumble recovery um timmy horn is another one of those fringe guys who's you know, maybe fighting for his NFL life right now. And, you know, you can say right place, right time, but without his fumble recovery on, on that botched snap between, you know, David Blow and David Blau, my apologies. The Blauhard, yeah. And um, I, think, <laughs> I think it was Justin Jackson in the backfield with him. Um, you know, the ball ends up on the ground and Timmy Horn was the only Atlanta Falcon who had any chance of recovering that fumble because Blau and, and the running back were, were right on top of him. And he recovers it, and the Falcons don't win without that play. Uh, D. Alford, Timmy Horn, and Jared Bernhardt, the, like I said, these are guys who are fighting for their, you know, for their NFL dreams right now. And I, I was so thrilled for each of them to make a massive, massive contribution in this game, even if it was in the form of one huge play each. Because the Falcons don't come close to winning that game without each of those guys making that play. So, you know, that that's what preseason's all about. That's what this is all about. You know, these guys going out there and, and making plays and, and showcasing themselves not only to the Falcons, but to every other NFL team. And I hope that each and every one of these guys at the very least gets gets a practice squad opportunity and continues having and pursuing this dream moving forward, whether that's with the Falcons or with anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned a lot of guys that I definitely agree to agree with that we'll, that we'll get into, but I wanted to give Aaron a chance to shout out his guys or some of the same guys as well before I, I take all the talking points away. So Aaron, please uh, indulge us with your defensive players that you were impressed with. Well, I'll start off with the negative, as I am want yes, to do. Yes, of course. Um, talk about the starters. Um, you know, for <laughs> someone who has been basically clamoring for the Falcons to add, you know, more beef up front for like, what, three months now? You know, that opening drive just kind of confirmed what I've thought. But like, you know, we'll see what the Falcons do, you know, when the final cuts are in, if they if they 
go and, and scour the waiver wire to, to sort of add some help there because th- they did kind of get pushed around uh, by that really good Lions offensive line to the Lions credit. But uh, y- you want to see that be a little bit better and tighten up. But among the starters, I thought Rashawn Evans did a, a really good job. Uh, he made a number of plays against the run, so that's one positive. Uh, they gave up, I think, a big play to Amon Ross St. Brown on a play action, and that was either a blown coverage from what I could tell by Evans or Dean Marlowe. So I, I think you know you, maybe you can attribute that to to new guys being a little bit uncomfortable in the scheme and making a mental error that led to a big play to the Lions. So that's something that they can clean up and, and should get better with time. But on to the positives, um, you know, I think the – I don't point out several of the guys that I thought played well. I am on D. Alfred Hive. I thought he played well. Certainly one of the standout players. I thought up front, Timmy Horn, in addition to that fumble recovery, uh, was really showing some physicality as a pass rusher. I thought Jalen Dalton did some nice things. I thought Nick Thurman did some nice things. So all those guys sort of fighting for one of these back-end D-line spots uh, certainly, uh, I think, moved the needle in a positive way. And I, I really liked the linebacker play. I thought Dorian Etheridge – and uh, Nate Landman played, uh, you know, well. You know, Arnold Ebiketti as a pass rusher, as Adnan pointed out, did some nice things. I thought Quentin Bell uh, impressed uh, in addition to D'Angelo Malone as well. So um, I think, you know, the Falcons' depth on the defensive side of the ball, the, several guys that kind of stood out that whether, you know, all these guys make the roster, at the very least you'll feel really good about some of these guys making the practice squad. And certainly, you know, guys that I think, you know, if they can continue to play at that level, will be good enough that other teams will be able to sign them. You know, uh, they may not even clear waivers if the Falcons decide to release them. And while, you know, that means that the Falcons may be losing a, a sort of talented, you know, developmental option for them, it is a good sign that you're seeing this defense make strides if other teams are claiming uh, some of their castoffs, um, which was not something that you would often see uh, on past Falcon teams. Yeah, I didn't want to see the Falcons claiming some of the guys that they had uh, on on some of these five or three season games. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I agree with a lot of the names you guys mentioned. I think to me, um, you know, obviously D. Alford was the one that stood out the most to me. Um, other guys, Rayshon Evans, I think was impressive on that that first uh, the the series with the starters. Um, you know, Rayshon Evans taketh and Rayshon Evans giveth, you know, um, giveth away, you know, in terms of coverage versus the run run defense. But you can definitely tell that, that Evans is that thumper that Dean Pease is really going to like. Uh, and they might need, depending on the play of the front, the front three, front four, whatever in front of them, uh, because that was definitely lacking against the Lions starters. Um Timmy Horn, I thought was good. I liked both of the, the undrafted linebackers. Both had a lot of opportunity to play with the second and third string with both Troy Anderson and Nick Kwiatkowski out. And those would have been like the two second string linebackers. So, you know, we basically got to get a really long look at Nate Lamman and Dorian Etheridge as a result. And I think both were, were good, good enough, certainly to be rosterable. Um, you know, I know on Aaron's show, he mentioned that Etheridge was playing a lot more special teams, which is true. Etheridge, you know, when he was on the roster here in Atlanta last year, ended up playing a lot of special teams. So he might have the advantage there. Um, I I agree with Aaron's take that, like, Landman was probably a little bit better on defense. Um, but, you know, for the same reasons that Kadero Hodge Hive might win the, the final, you know, fifth receiver spot because of special teams, the fifth linebacker spot if they do keep a fifth guy could go to the best special teamer as well. Um, so, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, I guess the safeties were okay. I was trying to think of anyone else that, that we missed, but, um, you know, we didn't get to see Jalen Hawkins, Richie Grant for one series, you know, Dean Marlowe and Eric Harris, I think were, were fine. Um, nothing super exciting. Um, and then on the special teams note, you know, young way nailed his extra points and, and field goals. And, Bradley Pinion, you know, on his like one punt, you know, great job. Uh, apparently it was good enough for them to, to cut poor Seth Vernon, who I thought actually punted well. Uh, but maybe this is them saying like, hey, you know, you're good enough to be an NFL punter. We're keeping Bradley Pinion. Like we're going to let you maybe get a chance to go actually compete and catch on with a team that's actually you have a chance to maybe make the roster as opposed to here in Atlanta where you really don't. Um, so we say bon voyage to Seth Vernon. Um, 
but yeah, uh, any anyone else? Either you guys want to mention from uh, that first preseason game? Yeah. Uh, not in a positive sense, but I, I thought that Mike Ford could have stood to have a, a much better game than he did. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Mike Ford. Yeah. He, he had that really that that play that I mentioned where the Falcons gave up that that third and forever play. Uh, Ford had Ford had the help on it. And he completely misjudged where the ball was, well, went too close to it, uh, tried to jump, and it, the ball just went over him comically. Like, it was, he didn't even come close to it. Um, I think Darren Hall also was completely blown by uh, on that play. Um, I forgot who it was. I think it was Khalif Raymond who had, who had that catch, if, if I remember correctly. Uh, Hall came back and, and had a... He had a better play later on, but yeah, Mike Ford overall struggled. Um, he's not going to be someone who I think is going to be starting over Isaiah Oliver when when Oliver is you know one hundred percent. I do think Ford will make the team. Uh, I think he actually played for the Lions previously, um, but yeah, uh, Aaron mentions hit that the first team defense could have stood to do to do much better. Um, the Detroit Lions have one of the better offensive lines in the NFL. I'd say they have a top ten offensive line. That's that's a real point of strength for for that roster, uh, and they've done a great job building it. But you know, overall, uh, going by the play by play and, and looking back on it, there were only two plays out of those ten where the Lions didn't get at least three yards and two more three yard runs, but. You know, other than those four plays, there was uh, an incomplete pass uh, or there was a one yard run by Swift and an incomplete pass to, to Jamal Williams, which was, you know, you know, not not the best pass and a couple of three yard runs. Other than that, it was just all chunk plays for the Lions um, uh, over and over again. Uh, Goff linked up with Almon Ross St. Brown, who I think is going to be really, really good moving forward. Um, a couple times, that uh, DeAndre Swift touchdown run. Uh, it, the middle was kind of plugged up, but but the left side uh, was completely open for him. And DeAndre Swift, being as good as he is, uh, uh, found found that hole and, and got an easy touchdown. But yeah, um, we definitely want to see the defensive line do a much better job against against the Jets because there was just there was just no real pressure at all uh, on the Lions running backs or, or on Jared Goff at all on that first series. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know a lot of people are already calling for like Mike Ford to be benched for D Alford and stuff like that. We'll see how that progresses. Mike Ford's going to make the roster because of his special teams acumen. Um, I think the team's been trying to see like, Oh, is Mike Ford better in the slot or outside or whatever on, by the same token, they've been having Alford play, in the slot, uh, whereas, you know, in the CFL, he played mostly on the outside from the little bit of CFL football I've seen. Um, so, you know, I think they were trying to see if Alford could play the slot, and clearly he can. He looked quite good there. So, um, you know, it's entirely possible that Alford is the one that's getting the the reps uh, in the slot, you know, if he needs to, if, if they have an injury there or need someone to, to fill in or, you know, we'll, we'll still see who the, the sort of dime defender is, whether that's a safety like Eric Harris or Dean Marlowe or Darren Hall, who seems to be the, the guy, the favorite for that role right now. Um, so we'll see. But I, I think so far uh, the secondary guys, those depth guys are looking pretty encouraging, except for Mike Ford, who had, you know, a really rough game, but it was just one preseason game. So we'll see. Uh, how he does. Um, yeah, you know, we'll just move on and, and get a couple of Kevin, guys could I you. jump in? Yeah, yeah, for go second? for it. Oh, yeah. Uh, Tease Tabor was another player that I thought oh, played right. really yeah, well yeah. Um, in the secondary. And um, picking up on Adnan's point about DeAndre Swift's one yard run, I don't know if you guys watched uh, yesterday's um, Hard Knocks episode, but at least according to Deuce Staley, the, the Lions running backs coach, the only reason he got one yard because uh, he hit the wrong hole. So, uh, that also does not bode well for the Falcons defense. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, there you go. Uh, I've, I haven't seen that episode yet. I, I know that's going to be a good one for Falcons fans because they're going to show the game and, you know, actually show the Falcons like winning so that, you know, will will be nice to see for a change on hard knocks. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, anything, you know, we, we've, we've, we've processed everything from the Lions game. 
It's in the rear view mirror. Now going up against the Jets. I know you already touched on it a little bit, Aaron, with your comment about you know the the trial by fire for the offensive line that seems to always happen against the AFC East. But what do you what are you what else are you looking for against the Jets? Is it mainly the offensive line that you'll be watching? Yeah, that that's it. Uh, you know, obviously, as always in the preseason, you know, which sort of second and third string guys, you know, make the make their case to make the roster and and those sorts of things. But that that kind of goes with the territory. But as at least as far as the starters uh, on offense, uh, as I said, kind of jokingly, there are some infamous performances against AFC East teams in the preseason where the Falcons get absolutely obliterated. There was that Dolphins game in 2015. There was the 2019 game against the Jets. And, you know, the week after that, we're just like, oh, God, here we go again. Another bad offensive line. We got to trade for Andy Levitri. We got to bench Ty Sambrello, all these various things. I was so. say, that Dolphins game was so bad, it, it gave Dimitrov no choice but to, <laughs> but to reach out for the deck ahead of it. Yep. And, yeah. I, you know, I know, I know a lot of people look at the Jets and, like, they're the Jets, like – who, you know, they're terrible, which, yeah, they are. But the one good, you know, like the Lions, the one good thing the Lions have is their offensive line. The one good thing that the Jets have is their defensive line. They're they're kind of stacked at that position. Um, and, uh, you know, they had three players against the Eagles last week that had five or more pressures. And the Falcons, I looked it up, have not had a player in the preseason uh, generate five pressures in a single game since 2015 where I think Stansley Mapanga did it in in the preseason oh, finale against the Jaguars, I think it was. Um, so the fact that, you know, they had three players in one game do something that a Falcons <laughs> defender hasn't done in like seven years is 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 is, is tough. So um Desmond Ritter and Marcus Mariota, you know, I I, I do not envy them if the Falcons offensive line uh lives up to its history of getting wrecked by AFC East teams so hopefully they will avoid that and if you know they come out of this game playing decent I, like I don't, I'm not even expecting them to like dominate or anything like that if they just come away decent that will be I think a much more favorable sign that this offensive line actually won't be as bad as some of us myself included think they will be this year yeah yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, Stansley Magoda over there, you know, uh, <laughs> with his five, pre- you know, I, I don't know why he didn't turn into a great, you know, player in the regular season. It's almost like preseason doesn't correlate with the regular season or something. But um, it is certainly concerning that the Falcons haven't had, you know, anyone else achieve that feat, you know, in seven years. So and that was um, a week four preseason game, too. Like, yeah. that doesn't even count. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's if only we had held on to Maponga and Jonathan Massaqua, you know, we may maybe we would have had that great pass rush, but you know, sadly, sadly Lawrence Sidberry, all yep. those guys, yep. Cap Vance Campy. Walker, yep, Vance Walker, <laughs> shout out, shout out to our guys. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's Adnan, uh, I'll, same question to you. What are what are you looking forward to watching uh, in the second week of the preseason here? Well, absolutely, the offensive line, like, like Aaron mentioned, like. The New York Jets defensive line is is very stacked. It's it's very stout. Um, but if if I'm gonna give a, a different answer, I want to see how the Falcons uh, compete uh, against some of this young talent that that the New York Jets have. Uh, I think that the Jets had a, a very good draft. Um, you know, they have Reese Hall, who is absolutely adored by the fantasy community right now, uh, as as a potential breakout candidate uh who they got at the top of the second round they dropped Garrett Wilson just a few picks after the Falcons took Drake London and you know after the Falcons correctly predicted and began that run on wide receivers that the Pittsburgh Steelers thought they could do it with quarterbacks but then you know they they just ended up over picking um you know for their quarter for Kenny Pickett I, I know that uh, Aaron really likes Kenny Pickett, so you know I, I had to give him a shout out. Pit legend, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, you know they they got Sauce Gardner, uh, who is uh, one of the best cornerbacks in, in the draft. Uh, I just want to see, you know, how the Falcons will will stack up uh, against against some of this really good young talent from the Jets, and we won't see Zach Wilson because uh, I think he had that uh, that torn meniscus uh, in the past game, but we will see. The legendary Joe Flacco uh, in, in this one with, with the first teamers for the Jets. Joe, you know, Joe Flacco still still kicking it. We'll see Mike White, who had one of 
inexplicably <laughs> one of the best games in the NFL last season. Yes, legend. <laughs> so uh, I think it'll be a good test. And uh, also I want to see um, how much longer the Falcon starters are going to play. Uh, they only got one series. I Maybe that had something to do with the fact that each team, the Falcons and the Lions had one very long uh, drive and it took the entire first quarter. But uh, I'd like to see if Arthur Smith throws the starters out there for, you know, maybe two or three different series uh, as opposed to just one because, um, you know, we'll have this game and I, I think we'll have one more against the Jaguars where the starters will go for a while because there's that week off between the last preseason game and the regular season now since they uh, changed the schedule and mercifully took away that that fourth preseason game in, uh, in exchange for a regular season game. But, um, yeah, you know, it, it'll, it'll be a good test and, uh, plug shameless plug, but Kevin and I will once again be calling that game on, on Monday. So, uh, yeah, uh, stick with us because, you know, not to pat ourselves on the back, but I, I think we did a pretty, pretty good job last week. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Great work by us for sure. Uh, on that, on that call, uh, especially the part when, you know, NFL plus shit the bed and like they switched over the stream to, you know, uh, they like the, even the NFL plus stream, they switched over to the green Bay 49ers game. So there was literally no way to watch it if you weren't in Atlanta. Um, so, you know, terrific product there, NFL, great job. Um, I guess it's preseason for them too. Uh, even though the whole point of the product is the preseason, but it, you know, whatever, whatever. I'm not, I'm not better at all about that. You know, not getting to see Ritter's, uh, you know, miraculous fourth down throw live, not, not better at all. Uh, so yeah, uh, it'll be Monday night, I believe is the Jets game. So, um, we still have a little bit of time, but it'll be, it'll be a fun one. I hope, you know, uh, we get to see, you know, this is the Flacco-holic after all. Uh, we're, we're big Flacco fans here at the Flacco Holic, so um, I think that was my favorite April Fool's Day bit that we ever did. So that that I think it's hard to top that one personally, but um, yeah, we'll get to see you know how the Falcons' defense looks against you know what should be a fairly middling offense uh, without its starting quarterback. I mean, I think Joe Flacco might actually be an upgrade. Maybe that's a hot take, but. <laughs> over Zach Wilson. Um, we'll see. But uh especially when the Falcons are on offense, like Aaron mentioned, uh seeing how this offensive line matches up, I think that's gonna be definitely something to watch. Um all right, we got we got uh George Costanza here with, with the with the late uh tip coming in. He's got a he's got a huge service announcement for everyone. Apparently, um Sonic is bringing back the pickle juice slushy. So, you know, for those of you that stand the Sonic pickle juice slushy, uh, it's, it's big. It's a big, you know, deal for George. Uh, he's, he's asking if, uh, Adnan and Aaron, will you drink one on stream for us? You know, it's I assume so George would buy the slushy for you. It sounds really gross to me, but the pickle juice. Slug. Yeah. It's got pickle juice in it. I imagine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, can't you pick a better one? I think the point is that it's it sounds disgusting. I think that's the point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm I'm a nay on that, George. I think it sounds gross. To be to be, fair. I'll do it. Yeah, uh, Aaron I'm, will I'm, do it. <laughs> I mean, I won't. Like George has never scared us wrong. Yeah, that's you know, true. He, that's true. He, he correctly <laughs> predicted Kyle Pitts. Uh, well, well before you know what we thought that he was going to be. Uh, well before we thought the Falcons were going to take him at four. But oh man. Pickle juice slushy, like, like <laughs> are they running out of ideas over at Sonic? Apparently, they're bringing it back as it, as in it was a thing before that they're now recycling. You think that one that one should have stayed in drafts? I think the pickle juice slushy, but you know, uh, yeah. Does no, it I'm, have some sort of a cult following? Like that's my guess is that it, it's like weirdly popular with a certain group. You know, like if you're into like savory like sweets, maybe maybe it's like maybe it's a. Uh, like those sweet pickles it's like the sweet pickle juice not like salty pickle juice so then maybe i don't i don't know how you would make that work in a way that was appetizing but may, maybe that is how it works okay <laughs> uh, i 
since it's not an alcoholic thing, I, 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 I may <laughs> yeah. possibly. Yeah. Okay. You know, we, we'll consider it. We'll consider it, George. It doesn't sound like my cup of tea, but yeah, I, I mean, it sounds gross, but, but I'm a hard maybe on it. Yeah. Okay. Hard, hard, maybe. Uh, Aaron already said he would do it. It took him like two seconds. This is, the, you know, Aaron's already a corporate shill. He's he's like you know <laughs> he's ready. Look, you know, you know between notice. drinking pickle juice, cold pickle juice, or, or watching the Atlanta Falcons, I I know which direction I lean into. Yeah, Aaron's probably one of those guys that that kept it in business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Secretly been a pickle juice slushy stand this whole time. You know, it was George every, every time. Every time I have to talk uh, about Marcus Mariota, I'll just take a sip on it. Instead yeah, exactly. Of about you, have to, you have to drink, uh, just take a sip of pickle juice slushy. You know? Yeah. So. <laughs> well, guys, uh, any any final takes, uh, Aaron, tonight before we wrap things up? I, I will say this, um, piggybacking on what Anand said about how much the starters will play. It would be sort of like galaxy brain type of stuff if Arthur Smith does what he did last year because the Falcons are having joint practices with the Jets this weekend. And like they did last year with the Dolphins joint practices. And he was like, oh, we we did a lot of good stuff in the joint practices. So I won't have to play my starters. And so he'll completely avoid the disaster of uh, the Falcons offensive line potentially getting exposed by the Jets defensive line if they have a really good uh, two days of practice. And and so, you know, I, I could see Arthur Smith <laughs> pulling that off yeah. and just avoiding that <laughs> headache altogether. Aaron, that sounds good in theory, but, you know, Kevin and I have to call this game and you have to watch every snap so you know maybe for our sake that that doesn't happen uh, and, series and, at least yeah, yeah we gotta get yeah, a series and, yeah. and, i mean arthur smith probably watches this show so you, you know maybe you you don't give him that suggestion okay yeah, all right yeah. oh, cut that out kevin yeah okay well we'll edit that out then we'll fix that in post yeah no, on a i do a lot show, of post yeah. i do a lot of post yeah. work on this podcast clearly yeah. uh, <laughs> it's the beauty of doing it live i don't have to do any post I yeah just, like don't get me wrong i'm not trying to watch yeah, as much as we love felipe franks i'm not trying to watch him for well and you know actually you know actually <laughs> felipe franks yeah, i'm kind of talking myself into it at this point no, I just need Felipe Franks to come in and pull like a Mariota and just have like one drive where he's just like flawless, just like runs for a touchdown, throws some bombs and just like wins the game or something. And then, then we can do the meme where it's like, you know, oh, like, you know, Marcus Mariota. It's like, okay, you know, that's like the regular brain. And then like Desmond Ritter is like, okay, that's a little bit more active brain. And then like Felipe Franks is just the ultimate galaxy brain now or whatever. So you know, yeah, maybe for that we, we could root for that. Yeah. Just wait until we re-sign Matt Sims for this specific game. Yes, just mm. for the simulator. I need that. So that 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 was the only redeeming value of that fourth quarter was we could keep making the simulator jokes, but that did wear off after a couple games. Uh, I think you guys remember that more fondly than I do. But <laughs> other than the bit, there wasn't really anything else going on with yeah, Matt Sims. Sadly, it, it'll never it'll never be us hyping up. Kurt Benkert in the uh, in the Hall of Fame game because we yeah. needed something to, to hold on to during uh, that. We'll always have those memories, Kurt Benkert. Mm-hmm. You know, Kurt uh, Benkert, the legend. Also, the NFL. I'm not going to lie. The NFL product just has this country by the balls. Like over <laughs> five million people watched the Hall of Fame game. Game was trash. Yeah, I, I mean, I wasn't one of them, but <laughs> yeah, you, you know, watching the game is like fine, but the people gambling on the hall of fame games. oh my god like, what are we doing here guys it's real preseason dgens you know <laughs> it's like oh, we don't even know how many snaps this guy is gonna play but i'm gonna put money on it you know maybe yeah. it's maybe it's more fair than ever because you know nobody knows what's gonna happen so it's just completely a coin flip yeah like at that point the hotline needs to call you if, you, if you're if you're gambling on <laughs> we saw you put you know two hundred dollars on you know uh felipe franks to throw a touchdown pass you know do you need help like blink once for you know like we need to get you out of your you know your basement or something uh, <laughs> did you did you make that better and you're, you're cackling a lot of it <laughs> no <laughs> not that one no <laughs> no <laughs> that's where all that belt bar money's going <laughs> <laughs> gotta reinvest wisely you gotta gotta diversify that portfolio so <laughs> all right guys well Adnan, did you have any other takes as well before we sign off uh investing in ethereum and felipe franks oh, okay um, very aggressive investment <laughs> strategies there that's for sure so um yeah change no, uh, your picture to a hexagon and dot eth 
<laughs> um, yeah, no, it's uh, I'm I'm excited. Uh, this was the best preseason game we've watched in in years and years. Um, at the very least, I'm grateful that it was an exciting finish and that it had our attention uh, until the very end. And you know, we would be so lucky for the next couple of preseason games to to be half as good as that one and, and to be as exciting down the stretch. So, um, you know, we we have to. Um, we have to watch these games. So I'm very grateful when, when they aren't just, you know, terrible. Yeah. So continue doing that. Dolphin. Yes, please. Like that was a fun preseason game to call. It was the first one ever, I believe. So, you know, <laughs> it helps when, when they're actually doing exciting stuff in the fourth quarter. Uh, and if, if it seems like maybe they're just going to let Desmond Ritter play the whole game. So that, that should keep everyone entertained decently well. So I appreciate that. We also got George Costanza saying, uh, oh, by the way, guys, I put a grand on the Eagles to win the Super Bowl. MGM was giving plus 2,800. So I believe that means that he would then win, uh, what, 28,000? Yep. So, hey, George, you know, very, very ballsy. I mean, I think, the like, that's not bad odds for the Eagles. I mean, I think they'll they'll be in the mix. I think they'll make the playoffs. I think they'll win yeah. the division, but I don't know if they're getting past the second round. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is the NFC, so I guess nobody really knows, but... Uh, yeah. George is going to be a big Jalen Hurts fan this year. Yeah, he's more a Jordan Davis fan. He says he believes in Jordan Davis. Fly Eagles yeah. fly. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, then we got Mad Tom K with the three dollars. He says if you bet on the Hall of Fame game, Calvin Ridley will call you and ask, "Are you sure you want to do this?" <laughs> <laughs> Ridley has learned his lesson. Okay, he's going to now be. It'll be his thing to call people that make these like you know ridiculous preseason bets and and tell them like, "Hey, you know, are you sure you want to do this?" Yeah, I, I saw on Twitter it was gaining traction. Someone uh, put down, I think, $2,000 on the Falcons to lose every one of their division games this year. And yeah. the comments were very funny. It's like, oh, Calvin Ridley has to be stopped right now. <laughs> <laughs> this man, he don't miss. <laughs> hey, Ridley bet on the Falcons to win when he wasn't playing. Okay, he was a team guy through and through, so I know it couldn't have been him. The, the if old... there was someone betting on them to win all six games, then I'd be suspicious. But you know, hey, it is what no, it I'm is. Not, that, that had me questioning Calvin Ridley's, you know, more than anything else. The fact that he was <laughs> on the Falcons to actually win. Yeah, yeah, I, I would have been more concerned if he bet on if, if he had uh, bet on them to to win. You know, like like he did certainly. So uh, it is kind of sweet, you know, in like a weird way. He's like, oh my guys, like, I I want to support my guys. You know, just fi- you know, maybe another like a text or something, or just like. You know, just go to the game and cheer or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, we said it at the time. It's like, yeah. if you're going to break the rules, at least make it more difficult for them to catch you. Right. So, or at least like ball out and put like some like ridiculous money down or something. Like if you're going to risk getting suspended here, you might as well like ball out. So I don't wasn't know. it like a 17 parlay or something? Something ridiculous. Yeah, it like was that? something really ridiculous. It was like less than $1,500 total or something. So, um, you know, I, yeah, you know, it is what it is. It's, is very bizarre saga of events this off season, but, uh, you know, if you guys, you know, are in that situation where you're, you know, determining whether you should place a sports bet or risk your NFL career, please learn from, from this scenario and, and do not, you know, place the bet, you know, or at least call someone to place the bet on your behalf. Yeah, d- like, don't like make it degenerates you yeah. yourself. And it's like, Oh, right. It, you know, at Calvin Ridley, huh? Like that's not suspicious at all, right? Yeah, he, he could have like you know it, he could have at least made it like sl- you know slide slide. Ron Mexico, like, yeah, yeah, he should have. Me- Carlos <laughs> Danger, you know, <laughs> Carlos Danger, baby. That that's that's always what I go with. But um, yeah, uh, you know, don't do that, guys. Don't don't do that. Um, all right. Well, I think clearly we've exhausted all of our you know interesting takes. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in tonight. Uh. Thank you, everyone. Please do like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Both those metrics really help us out. For those trying to get in on the fantasy league, uh, you have basically up until the end of the first or of the second preseason game before we set the draft date officially. Um, so if you are trying to get in, this is like your last warning to, to sign up. You know, this is this is it. This is that last warning. Um, so uh, we're we're in good shape. We got two 12 team leagues and just a couple spots to fill. So we're we're looking good. Um, and uh yeah guys really appreciate that it's patreon.com slash falcoholic live if you're interested um and yeah like i said like and subscribe and all that i'm kevin i at falcoholic kevin you know where to find me 
want to also plug my guests and let them plug their stuff. First of all, Aaron Freeman at Falc Fans, illustrious host of the Locked On Falcons podcast. Uh, Aaron, anything else you'd like to plug? Yeah, if you go to the Locked On Falcons on YouTube or your preferred podcast platform, you can check out uh, the episode right now uh, with Mike Rothstein coming on, talking a little bit about Isaiah Oliver, uh, you know, sort of getting some looks at safety and what that means, as well as some of his players that he thought are trending up and trending down. And that includes some of the guys that we talked about tonight, like Quadri Olison and Kadero Hodge. Uh, so go check that out uh, already up on Lockdown Falcons on YouTube. And, uh, you know, after you guys watch Monday night's action with uh, Kevin and, and Adnan calling the game, go, go check out Lockdown Falcons postcast uh, with myself and Jarvis Davis giving you our 15 minute thoughts after the game live on youtube as well you can find that on locked on sports atlanta yes yeah i did get a chance to meet jarvis uh at training camp that's a big dude like i was like oh man like you want to put him on the d-line next to anthony rush right yeah i was like oh man yeah like that uh you know that was interesting it's big big dude there so um yeah uh certainly uh enjoyed meeting him so definitely check that stuff out guys for sure uh yeah I guess until uh, next time, we've got, of course, Adnan Ikic as well here with us at Say Which Way. Adnan, anything you're working on you'd like to plug? Oh, yeah. Monday, I'll have this uh, article on uh, enjoying an NFL game day at home. Um, So uh, check that out. And, yeah, just uh, once again, plugging on Monday night, um, our play-by-play game cast of Falcons and the Jets and um, you know we won't be actually showing the game because that that would violate many many NFL licensing agreements and it would get us sued and it would get Dave in in very big trouble but um, you you know you can uh, sync up uh, our call to the game itself and you know my stream or my yeah my stream is a little bit ahead but you know I never really spoil it so you you know you don't have to worry about that but yeah i'm i think we'll be going live again like 15 minutes before the game so like 7 45 or so yeah yeah we will we will be doing that for sure so guys definitely check that out on monday night we'll be back for our next play-by-play show covering the falcons versus the jets um so yeah look forward to that and then it'll be just uh with that later game it'll be just another a little over a well, it'll be like two weeks or so, right? From then, um, till the first game, a little less than two weeks. I think the fourth is the first. No, it's it's the next week after that, isn't it? I can't, I can never remember. They, I, I haven't gotten used to this new schedule. I believe the first game for the Falcons is Sunday the 11th, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, um, yeah, so we got we got a couple more weeks left here still, but uh, we, we're getting there. We're getting inching closer to, you know, real non asterisk NFL football. So we're we're uh, looking forward to that. But again, thanks to Aaron for coming on. Thanks to Adnan for co hosting. As always, guys, thank you for watching. Uh, and we will see you on Monday night for the next preseason experience here on the Falcoholic Live. Until then, guys, have a great night. We appreciate you. See you, folks. <laughs>